Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back again with Mike DeBernardis for another episode of the award-winning The Corruption Files. Welcome back, Mike. Happy to be back, and congratulations on the award. It's your award, too, Mike. Today, we're going to take up one of my personal favorite frauds of all time. It is so audacious in scale and scope that we've talked about some audacious frauds, but in my mind, this is right up there at the top. This was planned out by the founder of the company and the senior executive leadership team, and they all executed it to a T until, of course, they didn't. It involved the sale of stereo equipment by a company called Crazy Eddie. It happened in the uh, 80s and 90s, primarily. I was a huge stereo equipment aficionado, so I was always interested in their pricing, which was the best. And Crazy Eddie outsold or undersold everyone. They had a really great method to do. It started with, they didn't pay taxes. So they were able to save a lot of money and they could pass those savings along to their customers in a great capitalistic mode, almost Dilbertian, if one might use that phrase. But in addition to not paying taxes, and they were in the Northeast, so state taxes were high, sales taxes were high, and of course, federal taxes as well, but they took cash for the largest portion of their payments and they didn't report that cash to the tax authority. So they even saved more money and they could pass that savings along to people like me. And this was pre-internet, so I didn't get to order from them, but I did look at their catalogs and their prices were very competitive, but it really just started there because they defrauded everybody. They defrauded their customers, they defrauded their bankers, they defrauded their investors, they defrauded the federal government, state government, local government, and they did so through a variety of levels. And they did uh, something called inventory inflation. I was very intrigued by that term, but they basically would take all of the company's inventories and ram it into one store, and then they would tell investors or Anyone who was looking, oh, yeah, we have this much inventory in every store. And then the next day, they would run all of that inventory to a second store. And when the auditors came, they saw a fully stocked store. So they had falsely inflated inventory levels, which means meant they were able to borrow more money to continue their expansive growth throughout the Northeast. And they appeared to be very financially healthy. And of course, that led to sales and revenue figures that were highly inflated. This led to a term called the Panama pump. And the Panama pump was a two-part scheme, Mike, where monies that purloined monies, I mentioned the tax schemes, but also the bank monies they were getting uh, because they were a private company, not a public company yet. And uh, they took the money and they laundered it to Panama. And then they would start to bring that money back to the company so that it appeared their sales were actually more than they were because they had more cash than they should have had. And this worked very well, but the people who did this were called the Antars. And the Antars decided Eddie Antar was president of the company. And he was so sophisticated that he sent his nephew, Sam, to college to become a CPA so that he could actually cook the books, literally. And when someone came to audit him, he was able to convince them that everything was fine. More on Sam later, but it was a complete, total and utter fraud all the way up and down the company. The, but of course, greed took over. And Eddie figured that if he could snooker all of those other people, he could probably snooker the stock market through stock manipulation and fraud. So the company went public. And they just continued what they were doing. But what they did, Mike, this is where the Panama pump really came into its own because they brought the money in massive millions that had been laundered into offshore shell accounts in Panama or offshore accounts through Panama was then brought back into the company so that it was, it appeared to be doing very well. Of course it wasn't. And eventually it all crashed and burned. And this is where we get to talk a little bit about Sam, because Sam decided that he was going to turn state's evidence and became the whistleblower that brought all this down. And Sam has gone on to a long and distinguished career as one of the earliest whistleblowers and one of the earliest people who said, 
hey, this is wrong. Don't be like me. I engaged in fraud. Don't do it. And pointed out many of the lessons that we still talk about today for compliance professionals. Some of those lessons included, obviously, in corporate governance, where you, you need to have independent oversight. You should have segregation of duties. Whistleblower protections are now critical. And Sam Antar really pointed the way with what happened to him when he blew the whistle on his uncle and others within the company. Financial transparency, the re requirement or the need for accurate financial reporting, internal audits and continuous monitoring, third-party audits, and unchecked control by a single individual or family. We really haven't had that too often in this series, at least in this season, Mike, but here the Antars literally controlled everything and they were able to hide from investors. Eddie ended up moving to Israel in the middle of all this crash where he thought he was safe. He was, however, extradited back to the United States and was uh, sentenced to prison. I want to say a few more words about the Panama pump, partly because it was the theme of a movie, and that movie was called The Accountant. And in that mm. movie, Ben Affleck played an accountant who uncovered financial fraud. He also happened to be a world-class level assassin. He had a, a side gig as well as his accounting gig, but he uncovered that the company had engaged in the Panama pump to prop it up. And so there was uh, some amount of publicity around that. But it, it also shows, Mike, that it's not simply the fraud. It was the money laundering. And, and I say that in the context of the recently released TD Bank of America, sure. TD Bank AML enforcement action, where there were three separate AM, massive AML schemes that criminals used because the bank's AML program was so lax. So it still exists in 2024. And money laundering obviously is still a problem, even at a bank that's number 30 in the, the world. and the U.S. subsidiary was number 10 bank in the United States. Money laundering is still a real problem. The Panama pump can still be a real problem. It's a deliciously audacious scandal. There have been both shows on it and documentaries. And Sam Antar is still out there beating the bushes talking about this case. So a lot to unpack there. I would say, what were your, what are your initial thoughts? But I'm not sure anyone can have initial thoughts on something this big. I just might ask for your thoughts. So many, so many thoughts after that introduction, Tom. I, I think one of the things that struck me <clears throat> most here was how I mean, you said audacious and it certainly was audacious, but just so how, uh, so foundational this fraud was to the company's business. And, and really the only way that this could have been executed was with help, right? This is not the type of scheme that could be some of our, some of the past cases we've touched on where one or two people were cut off acting rogue. This is not a type of scheme that one, one person could do on his own or her own. And Crazy Eddie here used uh, his family, uh, who he mentioned kind of controlled all aspects of the business to basically facilitate is fraud. I mean, I really, from what I can tell, the company itself was built on this fraud. It wasn't, this is not a situation where it was a really good stereo company that just started engaging in some fraudulent activity. It seems like it was, its business model was fraud from the start, even though, I don't know, it doesn't sound like you bought any of the stereos, but I hope at least the product were of high quality. The other thing that, that sort of just stood out to me as being in so wild is that Crazy Eddie, and, and an app's name, I suppose, thought that taking this company public was going to be a solution to any problem he might have because the, the only way this scheme works is if you have very little to no oversight and no corporate governance in place. And as soon as you go public, and it does take a little bit of time, and as we've seen before, you can manip manipulate boards of directors to a certain extent. But the oversight, the auditing, the reporting obligations, all of that ratchets up. And there was really no way to hide this. I was saw, I mean, it did crumble fairly quickly after the IPO and after Crazy Eddie cashed in on some of his stock, of course, before fleeing to Israel. But 
we often talk about lessons and what can be learned. And this is just stands out to me as a glowing example, a poster child for why some of the corporate governance requirements are that, that exist for publicly traded companies in the U.S. And, and other parts of the world exist. It's for oversight to prevent things like this from running wild and all of these investors who bought in on the IPO that were, that were ultimately duped. Uh, that That's spot on, Mike. And the I guess the other lesson that perhaps we haven't had yet in this series is when you have one family that controls a company, you're setting up for potential opacity and lack of transparency in all aspects. And I would say, I don't know how much you followed the boar's head, there's a listeria scandal, but in that case, it's a private company and the CFO could not identify the president of the company in a deposition under oath. So talk about opacity when the CFO cannot identify the president of a company and there's a, a tripartite group of men, three men running this company, but he can't point to one person who said they've got oversight. And so that is a huge red flag. And for anyone looking at investing in a company, that should be something that you would have to think very hard about if you saw one family or a group of families controlling an entity, because you're not going to get any information, you're not going to get any insight, you may not get an audit report, and you may not have any monitoring of the controls or controls monitoring going forward. So that's like, like I said, that's a lesson I don't think we've seen in this case, yeah. or excuse me, in this series. And so I really wanted to to highlight that one. But I'm with you. The only thing I can think of was Fast Eddie saw a huge payday by going public. And it was. Yeah. Because the companies, the books looked great. He had this cash he could pump back into the United States from Panama, which he did. It pumped up the stock price. He dumped it. He made millions. It was, this is before the time where we talk about billions, but he made hundreds of millions and he took off to Israel with that money and he thought he was safe there. And maybe that was his play all along. It's yeah. just a cash out going IPO, but you're right. I think it was less than 18 months after going IPO when the entire thing crashed and burned because somebody's going to look, whether it's a regulator, whether it's an investor or whether it's one of the stock exchanges. For me, that was a, a pretty big lesson in, in terms of corporate governance and why I think people need to just keep talking about this. And whether that imperils Boar's Head or not, I don't know because they're a private company. But when you don't have the transparency into the decision-making process, can't figure out who did what, why, how, where, or for what reason. Yeah. And, and your, your point about the sort of having a the company closely held by a family is a good one because we often think about uh, nepotism uh, and, and the downsides of that being that you have underqualified or, or clearly unqualified people in, in positions that they shouldn't be in. And that is obviously one of the problems with, with nepotism among, among many. But one of them, I think, is really, this is a, this is a good example of Various roles at, at companies, I mean, they're, they're split up, whether you're private or public, uh, for, for people to have various different roles is to serve as sort of checks and balances on each other. Uh, and that's difficult to do in the best circumstances, right? It's, it's difficult for a, a CFO to step up to the CEO and say, I don't think we should do this or a general counsel or the head of auditing or whoever it might be. It becomes very difficult when that CEO is your uncle who you've idolized your entire life and is telling you, oh, no, this is the way we do business. It's perfectly fine. And so that adding that extra dynamic when everybody is from the, the same family is it, it can be, it can really, really strip the independence of the various roles to, to meaningless. You know, that's a great point to perhaps end our discussion on Crazy Eddie because Sam Antar the fellow who was trained to be the CPA and was part of the fraud, he idolized his uncle. Mm -hmm. And I've seen interviews with him where he was very clear. This was the man I looked up to and I wasn't going to say no to him. It, it, it was almost not that I couldn't say no, but I wasn't just because I idolized him so much. And in the world you and I play in, it's generally a public company. If it's not a public company, it's a massive 
private company that does have those checks and balances in place. So perhaps it's good to think about these basics from time to time. Yeah, and look, it doesn't happen as much in public companies where there's stockholders who, who will object and boards of directors who would object, but there are some very large private companies that are closely held by a, a family. And I think it is something for those companies to think about, for anybody who's going to do business with those companies to be thinking about is how does corporate governance work when this pers the person who's supposed to be checking on the activities of this major business is the, the nephew who's not going to want to stand in the way of his very famous, uh, albeit crazy uncle. And I think that's probably the best line to end this on. It was all just crazy. <laughs> exactly.